tool for the mind. And we are still talking about that. Uh, we uh, Thus far, we talked about the meaning of the word, um, symbols associated with the word. Uh, we've also talked about the brain, parts of the brain and language. So that, you know, when we start actually talking about uh, formulating mantras, you will have a really good understanding of how they work and how the brain processes what it is that you say, as well as what others say to you or about you. So that's, that's going to be very important to uh, like wrap your head around. So I just want to reiterate um, uh, parts that we were talking about because on part three, we were talking about the brain language and just being able to discern whether the brain was a computer, an antenna or both. So I want you guys to share out what did you glean from uh, part three, last part of part three, um, because as you know, learning without reflection is a waste and reflection without learning is dangerous. So uh, talk about what those of you who were on and you did not share, I want those that did not share, I want you to share first as to your takeaways from the last part of part three. Peace instructor. Um, what I got from that last piece is um that you know a lot of our actions are happening due to unconscious collection of data. So um, the subconscious collects data in literal means. So that means um, like like before that video, before you told us about that, I will watch something and be like, okay, I'll just do it out this knowledge. Or like, even though I'm watching this and I know that this information is kind of hogwash, um, I know that it's not real, so like I'm good. But after you told us that the subconscious picks up everything literal, now I'm much more careful about what I'm watching, what I'm listening to, who I'm around to, um, even more so after that, because that affects our behavior. So that's what I got from it. Right, wow, that's a very, that's a very powerful, very good takeaway. Because as you stated, the subconscious mind takes everything literally it, it, even though your conscious mind says, oh, this is some hogwash, this is not real, blah, 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 your subconscious mind doesn't process it that way. So yes, you are correct to be vigilant in your thoughts and what you're watching and also who you're around. So good, good takeaway, Emerson. Appreciate it. Another takeaway. Yes, sir. Give me another takeaway. another takeaway. Please, instructor. Uh, I, I have down, uh, writing down your goals um, and how, how powerful an effect that has on your subconscious mind and uh, allows you to extend your dreams and thoughts into the physical realm. That was uh, one of the biggest takeaways for me. Yes, very good, very good, very good. Um, writing is uh, um, in the reticular activating system. Um, as uh, Hero said, it's like a drafting. <laughs> uh, you are actually drafting those thoughts into this 
three-dimensional construct. So when you begin to write, you are drafting or building the blueprint as to what you want to create in this construct. Very good point, very important takeaway. So writing is very powerful. Good, give me another takeaway. takeaway um about the um subconscious mind uh -huh. never never sleeping it's always awake it's always like on record yes. just taking in everything in your surroundings even when you're sleeping the subconscious mind does not sleep Absolutely. <laughs> and it can you can take on traits that the subconscious mind has gotten from things that you picked up without mm -hmm. even knowing. Absolutely, very, very good point, very important point. Uh, especially for those of us who sleep with the television on. Uh, my wife has a terrible habit of sleeping with the TV on. And um, things that are on the TV, no matter you know, what's on there, they seep into your uh, subconscious mind. Uh, and the subconscious mind, as Aaron said, never sleeps. It's always up. Uh, so that's very important, very important point. Thank you for sharing that. Give me another takeaway. We talked about how the mind isn't necessarily like in the brain and how um like your mind is like different from your brain so to speak right right now let me let me push a little bit on that Aaron. now so uh someone offered uh asked that question as we were breaking down parts of the brain and i asked the question question, and I wasn't the only one to ask that question, where is the mind in the breakdown? And it led this particular person to discern what the brain was. Do you remember that, Aisha? Not but we had like a really intense conversation about it surrounding like, um, like the brain, like I, I just remember we had something like it, it had to do with like information, but I don't remember exactly how it was broken down. Yeah, so let me let me let me help you a little bit here. So, in sharing, um, we, we didn't go into all of the parts of the brain, just four parts of the brain that dealt with language, right. In all of the parts of the brain, we weren't able to uh, say, hey, this is mine. This, this, is, this part of the brain right here is mine. So it's a, a uh, uh, gentleman that wrote an article about uh, Flynn, F-L-I-M. And in that he, arrived at the same conclusion that we did when we were looking at parts of the brain. He said uh, something about what the brain could be. Uh, do you remember now? No, because I'm not looking dead at my notes right now. Okay. So, um, so remember we were talking about, could the brain be a computer? Could it be an antenna or both? And based yeah. on, go ahead. Oh yeah, it, it can act as both. Right. But this gentleman uh, offered that it was an antenna because he couldn't locate the mind in the brain. And someone else offered that the brain was a quantum computer because of how it functions. So these are some very important points 
as to, um, you know, it, it leads to a couple of things. First, it lends itself to how the brain operates and processes language and information, right? That's the first thing. And secondly, it uh, gives rise or gives scientists an indication of how to uh, uh, create or recreate brain. Uh, and they were doing a, a, a study at Brown University where they actually were working on an artificial brain uh, that they were preparing to implant into a human uh, in order to uh, function as a human. Um, so this was, this is why all the inquiry around the brain was uh, formulated so they could discern how the brain was functioning and how the brain was acting, they can reproduce a replica of it as best they could. And that's what they were working on in Brown University. But that's a, yeah. some uh, very important information to, to, to know that they're working on stuff like that. And you very well could run into someone that does not have a human brain. It's a man-made brain. <laughs> so uh, they are actively working on that right now. Okay. Any other reflections about part three? Give me someone that has not shared yet. Peace, instructor. Peace, peace, peace. What, what stood out to me most was really something that wasn't really discussed, but it's something that <clears throat> I'm observing you do. Um, mm -hmm. you, you, you modeling um, through the beginning of, the, of each lecture with, with you asking for good news. <clears throat> Essentially, we are collectively um, restructuring the brain, we are creating a mantra in, of sorts and just the way we are deciding to look at um, the events of the day, the phenomena that are happening, mm -hmm. deciding what lens we are going to view them through mm -hmm. um, essentially becomes um, the framework for uh, a mantra of sorts. And so that was the, <clears throat> what I, overall, I mean, you've, obviously been providing um, some, some, some powerful uh, insights and, and information for us, some empowering information. But what, what has stood out to me thus far is the power we hold in the decisions, um, how we choose to view the phenomena moment by moment that are, mm -hmm. that, that's, that's unfolding. So I, I, I really have, kind of that's kind of been the thing that I've keyed in on and it's been sticking with me the most out of everything is that this is the, the brain is is an organ that we tell it what to do essentially the mind will tell the brain how to how to perceive things and we begin to train ourselves in a way um we can we can begin to see everything as good news or or as an opportunity um, we can see everything uh, as, you know, we were working at Leopard. And so the opportunity, the mantra, every movement, every motion, every opportunity or every moment is pregnant with opportunity and possibility. And so mm -hmm. it's really a matter of training the mind to see that um, on the floor it didn't translate necessarily at first. And then in that last week of Leopard, it finally started clicking like, oh, this is an opportunity to do something. Right. So. Um, I want to be able to better explain that or, 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 um, present that for, for those who may not have been on the floor with us, or even have, have seen animal systems in, at play. 
Um, so I'll work on that. But for those that are, have been involved, hopefully what I'm saying is making sense. So that, that was, that's been my takeaway. Good. That is good. Um, uh, yeah. Uh, and you right in picking up on um, how class is started and how, how I've started classes with good news because um, if you create a lens of good to look through, that's what you'll see. <laughs> uh, because uh, some of us have had some, you know, like, man, this was a challenging day, <laughs> right? However, something good happened uh, today. <laughs> and you, you want to highlight and end and focus on the good that happened uh, today. So that's why, you know, as a practice, I'll say, hey, let's somebody share some good news. Something good happened to somebody today. And uh, just in hearing the good news of others makes you reflect on the good that happened with you. So that's a very good observation, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, good, good. So sounds like we got some really good uh, takeaways. Um, uh, the, the last point here is I can change or rewire my brain um, uh, was another point that was taken out uh, or, or highlighted in part three uh, in uh, the uh, scientists from neuroplasticities actually state that you can actually rewire, reprogram, and change your brain. Um, uh, that can actually be done. There is a way to do it. And that's where, that's the direction that we're going into. However, uh, there are some things that you need to understand as to uh, as a part of the subconscious, what's in there. Oftentimes we don't know, or when you talk about the subconscious mind or when we refer to the subconscious mind, we don't realize that uh, as Emerson stated uh, at the top, 90 to 95% of your behavior comes from your subconscious mind. Uh, in giving presentations like this uh, in the past, oftentimes people don't realize that, uh, that fact. They discern or think that their behavior comes from what they are consciously thinking about and or are aware of. And the opposite is true. Um, your behavior actually comes from a place that you really don't know a lot about what's in there. So uh, a lot of the behaviors that you are acting on uh, are coming from places that you may or may not know. Uh, so I wanna dive into that in this part here um, and talk a little bit about that. So um, reality, what shapes your reality and how is your reality shaped? Um, millions of signals bombarding your brain. Are your thoughts really yours. Just think about that. Are your thoughts, and I'm putting your, I should have put your in quotation marks, are your thoughts really yours? And here in this part of the uh, presentation, I'm making the case why involution or uh, evolutionary change is a necessary responsibility. 
uh, um, uh, and that's what this part of the presentation is about, making the case of uh, why evolutionary change is a necessary responsibility. Does anyone know or remember what involution means? Because that's gonna be important. I don't wanna use terms that you, you don't remember, or you don't know. <clears throat> I believe the definition that we were working from was the mathematical definition, which was a function a transformation or operator that is equal to its inverse. Okay. Anybody else? Paul offered a mathematical definition there. Anybody else? Go to your notes if you don't if you don't remember, because this was transformation or operator that is equal to its inverse. Okay. Okay. From what I remember, it um, could be involving yourself in um, active change, like within self. Yeah, ding, 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 ding. That's 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 good. Yep, yep. That's, that's yep. So there was two definitions. Paul offered the highly technical definition, and Emerson offered the other, saying that you is. It, it's important that you be involved in the change, <clears throat> that you yourself be involved in the change. Involution is when you take part of the change. Uh, so here in this part of the presentation, uh, I'm going to uh, make the case as to why you should be a part of the change. So uh, CJ, you with us? CJ? Hello, CJ. Could somebody take this slide for me? I wanted CJ to take it, but can somebody else take this slide? Psychology, major influences in the study of the mind in Western philosophy. There are others that the ideas to enhance and control the minds of the populace are taken. Okay, could you read those names up top for me, Kenyatta? Uh, Jean Piaget, Carl Jung, Sigmund Freud, uh, Boris Skinner, William James, John Watson, and Ivan Pablo. Yeah, uh, now the last one, uh, I think I, I'm gonna be talking about him, but these are the major psychologists who have offered uh, research and uh, how uh, a lot of um, Western philosophy have been formed off of what these men think or thought about the mind. As you can see, they're all white males, okay? Now, as I said here, there are others here, and I'm gonna offer another um, uh, here, but these are the major players uh, in, in Western philosophy.
King Yana, could you take could you take this one as well? Yes, sir. Um, I'm having a little bit of trouble seeing uh, the top of that slide. Um, uh, no, don't worry about the top of read the orange. What's in the orange? Because I read I reprinted it because I knew you were gonna have problems reading it. Okay, all right. So all of our great leaders have warned us of the threat of psychological warfare. Mm -hmm. uh, could you read what Dr. King offered? The subtlety of this type of warfare makes it insidious. Okay. Mm. Uh, just above Dr. Martin Luther King's head, his what he said about it. As long as the mind is enslaved, the body can never be free. Why does it be okay? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's okay. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Absolutely, sir. <laughs> <laughs> Talking about somebody have a dream. What? Right. <laughs> You're a lot deeper than that, bro. <laughs> uh, indeed. Read the next one, please. Uh, Garvey, um, the white man's propaganda has made him the master and everyone else his slave. <laughs> yes, sir. And uh, Malcolm X, uh, the white media will have you hating your own and loving them. Malcolm X. <laughs> this one as well, uh, Kenyatta. These Biko. <laughs> All right, <laughs> the most potent weapon in the hands of the oppressor is the mind of the oppressor. Is the mind of the oppressed. We need to pay closer attention to what our leaders were doing. Go ahead, go ahead, I'm sorry. Uh, there is much we need to understand about how it is done. Once we understand how it is done, we can undo it. Indeed. Mm -hmm. cool. Thank you, sir. Now, this particular slide um, is a, a, so, a, a sociologist. Uh, and it's important uh, here, uh, I, I put him at the top of this discussion because he had a major influence on uh, the looking glass self. Could someone uh, read this particular slide, please? Socialization restructuring starts with you. The social self is simply an idea or system of ideas drawn from the communicative life that the mind cherishes as its own. And that's Charles Horton Cooley. Mm -hmm. And um, Charles Cooley uh, was a sociologist that coined the, my bad, notification. So uh, he was a sociologist that coined the looking glass self. The first bullet point says uh, how we, we imagine how we appear to others in the social situation we imagine and react to what we feel their judgment of that appearance must be. We develop our sense of self and respond through these perceived ju judgments of others. Cool, thank you, sir. Someone else get that side for me, please. I got it. Oh, okay, for sure. uh, Self-knowledge. In philosophy, self-knowledge commonly refers to knowledge of one's particular mental states, including one's beliefs and desires. Self-knowledge is a term used to describe the information that an individual draws upon when finding an answer to the question, what am I like? Cool. <clears throat> now, it's very important to, I thought, I thought this definition was very important to coin because if you ask someone else what self-knowledge is, they wouldn't necessarily give you these definitions. So uh, especially uh, the, the, the second one. Aaron, could you read that second definition again? 
Yep, I got you. Self-knowledge is a term used to describe the information that an individual draws upon when finding an answer to the question, what am I like? Yeah. And and going back to Cooley uh, and where he turns the looking glass self and what he offers is we imagine and react to what we feel the judgment of that appearance must be. We develop our sense of self and respond through these perceived judgments of others. And that's why I follow this one up by, you know, the term self-knowledge and what that means to sociologists and psychologists, uh, uh, which is very important. Because when we say, you know, self-knowledge, oftentimes we're talking about self-knowledge from a historical uh, perspective. We're talking about knowledge of where we come from, continent, Africa, or where, whatever continent you may be from, uh, Europe or Australia, you know, it, it, you know, uh, so, um, uh, that's where, you know, most people, when you ask them about self-knowledge, they'll go down this, uh, this, uh, this ancestral tree. But that's not what they mean by self-knowledge. So it's very important to make the distinction here. Could someone get this slide for me, please? Society serves as our mirror or looking glass. This theory proposed that personality developed. This theory proposed that personality personality developed depending on how we see ourselves reflected in others. How does television programming affect your sense of self? Okay, let's start with you there, JBI. Um, that question. Um, That's what you think. How does television programming affect your sense, your sense of self? How do you think? Uh, identifying with uh, your favorite shows or movies, you can You can basically create uh, your own personality from what you watch often. Um, maybe your favorite character, you might end up having similar traits or characteristics that you take on from watching certain things on a consistent basis. Okay, good, good. Anybody else? Talk yeah, I got something to say too. So, especially uh, for us as, um, Black people in America, the use of black exploited movies, like you always seeing, um, so like a, a black person as a drug dealer um, and gangs and stuff like that, that can affect you psychologically because like they paint it in a way that it looks like glorified for real. So then kids might take that and see, oh yeah, I want to be, I want to be the the neighborhood dope. <laughs> I'm sorry, the neighborhood dope man and all of that stuff. Mm -hmm. Okay, good, good. Anybody else? Yeah, I would, uh, I would uh, say that it would also work in inverse of when you watch something like reality TV and you see um, everybody has a big house, um, a new foreign car and plastic surgery, body perfect, that somehow you are not enough or you're not enough or you're not pretty enough you don't have enough money or whatever by looking at certain things on tv as well absolutely it automatically sets up that comparison good good give me give me some more on this um i was gonna say uh, like trauma in trauma Im imagery mm -hmm. like especially around like black history month or like um when something happens like with, like for instance, last summer, like George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, mm -hmm. like it was like trauma. And then it sends people back only to like 1950, 1920. 
And it's like, that's all the history you get. So, but if that's all that you're seeing, like, that's like all you really kind of can think you can't come from, which is like, it's true, but it's also more to the story. And I mean, everybody doesn't internalize like those visuals the same. And so um, I think that like a lot of what you see is, especially in like African-American TV is like trauma or like, it's always got to be like that. And so that's, that, that gets ingrained in your head a lot of the time. Oh, okay, very good. Now, let me ask you a question, Aisha. Uh, what does trauma do to the brain? Um, I guess it, it, it does a lot. It causes, it causes you to be like defensive about things you shouldn't be defensive about. It causes you to stress. It causes you to like, it like breaks you down mentally sometimes. So it causes distress and, um, it, it makes you act in different ways. It changes your behavior patterns. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Instructor, can I chime in? Yes, you certainly can. So, in, in thank you. In, in the um, in, in congruence with what we've been talking about about how the brain itself functions, um, seeing as though the brain sees everything or the eyes see everything, and the brain filters what it's going to focus on, and the ears hear everything, and the brain filters what is actually being acknowledged as far as the audio signal. Um, television programming will have an effect because uh, we're seeing images uh, in certain colors. You talked about psych psychological effect that, that colors have in marketing. Um, certain subliminals are, 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 are shot. And even though it's been made illegal, we, the, the, the brain isn't um, acknowledging in real time what's happening in, in however many frames per second that's being uh, shown on the screen. So that's just the, on the subliminal level, let alone what's happening on the overt, purposeful, we want you to get this message level. And <clears throat> all input is going to uh, cause those wrinkles and those uh, synapses to form and fire. Um, and we're gonna have these sensory files that, that are created based on whatever input, whether it's positive or negative, um, whatever we're deeming positive and negative. So television programming could be dope. I mean, it could be um, in a good way or it could be dope in the, in the bad way, right? Um, mm -hmm. Like a drug. So you have programming on Sesame Street that I recall from when I was, you know, a, a little child that was, that was very positive. You know, that was the electric company and all of that type of television, Mr. You know, Mr. Rogers and all of those, all of those folks were, you know, watching, uh, you know, certain messages on on Fat Albert and even, mm -hmm. you know, Bill Cosby's personal stuff aside, the positive programming that was on with the Cosby show in a different world. A lot of those things had a positive impact. We look at also the impact that I think hip hop on television and the Cosby show, Rap City and all that I had on the people who voted for President Obama, for example, without that television programming, I don't know that they would have seen um, a black man outside of a threat, but actually as the leader of the quote unquote free world, I think television programming through the eighties and nineties had a lot to do with how people perceived someone like Barack, who was, you know, he fit that kind of, that, that smooth, but still hip hop, he had a little hip hop swag. Long and the short of it, I'm saying that television programming could go either way. It could sway you and the brain can it can sway you one direction or the other because the mind the brain is picking up on everything that's happening on TV um, mm -hmm. whether we're aware of it or not and so it's one of those like any other wave uh, it's one of those signals that's just happening to and through us and 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 we have to be very um, very aware and alert and, and have a discerning eye and ear when it deals with whatever information you, we consume. Right, right. Well, okay. Anybody can can I go? Yes, please. Uh, I don't know if anyone has seen The Social Dilemma that um, that's on Netflix. And it, I mean, 
it basically just breaks down uh, the effects of like social media and everything like that uh, on what is happening to the youth. And a lot of the youth are going through like depression and the suicide rate of uh, teenage girls have you know, skyrocketed since and it's literally parallel to the, the rise of social media. So, you know, um, I mean, I, that can be added to how does television programming, I would assume, because, you know, we're not actually, you know, everybody's on phones now. So I, I, I would say phones is part of that television programming is that we're being programmed. And I don't think people understand that when we're saying there's, Yeah, I don't think people understand that we're the ones being programmed in the situation. So, like, uh, we have to be vigilant in, like, as what what Paul was just saying is, and it, and it goes into, like, last week as well, uh, watching our diet and what we consume because we have to be conscious in understanding, like, what we started off at the beginning of uh, the class and understanding the subconsciousness guides us. And so... With that understanding, we can be vigilant in our uh, viewing of, you know, what we watching. We can be conscious of it and be like, okay, this is enough. I can cut it off. And so we got that power to make that discernment to say, okay, this is not a, this is not good for me, or this is just too much. But without that understanding, without that knowledge of the effects of the programming, you're going to be susceptible to just be programmed mm -hmm. and uh we have the ability all of us have that choice to be programmed or to not be programmed so if a person doesn't in my opinion if a person doesn't understand the fact that a television program does program them it's it'll, it'll be harder for that person to actually grow in consciousness as opposed to you know knowing what is at stake so once we know what is that thing, we can move vigilant. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's why that's part of the reason for this particular question, for this conversation, and at the top, making the case for involutionary change is exactly um, what was offered at the top of this and how uh, television programming uh, that question, how does it affect uh, your sense of self, our collective sense of self, and how we're portrayed on television is definitely a part of the programming. Um, so there's a lot in this question um, here. So let me offer the, the next part here. So there's a lot in that question, correct? So we talked about the conscious mind. We talked about the subconscious mind. So um, does anyone have any idea of how many bits of information the conscious mind actually takes on? I don't remember the exact number of instructors, but I know it was millions of bits of information. Okay. Didn't he say 40 million? 40 million bits? He said 40 million. The conscious mind takes on 40 million? I thought you said, no, no, no I'm sorry, no, no, no. You said 400, 400 bits, and the uh, subconscious takes in 40, I believe you said 40 million. I believe that's, that was the last bill we had. Maybe uh -huh. I'm probably off. <laughs> so you you remember my last conversation, right? Yes, sir. <laughs> okay, I, I got you. I got you. So uh, here, um, the conscious mind takes on 40 bits of information per second, right? 40 my bits apology. of information per second. No, there's no need to apologize because this information is not like out there or known. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? Uh, however, the uh, subconscious mind takes on 40 million bits of information per second. So 
and the 40 million bits of information per second, mm. you're not aware of all of it. Mm. You are only aware of 40 bits of it. Mm. However, 40 million bits, your subconscious has taken in. Right, that's, that's huge. Uh, again, at the top, making the case for you to be involved in the process of the change, right? So can somebody take this slide for me and fill in those, uh, those uh, colored question marks? The brain is bombarded with millions of bits of information telling the mind who you are. The conscious mind, 40 bits of information per second. The subconscious mind, 40 million bits of information per second. Yeah, thank you. Somebody else take that slide, please. So come on, ladies, let's get some feminine energy in here. <laughs> what does the programming tell you about yourself and who you are? Okay, get that one. The programming has given shape to who you think you are, where you think you are, <laughs> robbed you of an authentic culture, birth and mental, spirit, the concept of divinity. Yeah, uh, that's a lot right there. Mm -hmm. That's a lot right there. And that's just in television programming. Uh, because uh, last time I checked, we didn't write any of the programs. Uh, very few of us have anything to do with the writing of the program or determining what programs actually come over the airwaves. Uh, Someone mentioned Bill Cosby at the top, um, but it's an interesting fact that you need to know about uh, Dr. Cosby. Uh, Dr. Cosby had entered into a partnership uh, about buying some, uh, a station, a, a, a network. Uh, so uh, he was about to, uh, or, or petitioning to own and control something like a CBS or NBC, right? Uh, months after he started his campaign for that, we get all of these um, accusations and uh, women coming out of the woodwork and he ends up failed. Uh, you can rest assured that there was a rhyme and reason behind that. Mm -hmm. uh, very few people knew what he was attempting to do. Uh, uh, it started as a campaign. He was uh, launching a campaign around the country where he was being quite frank about and talking to specifically the black community about what we needed to do in taking responsibility for ourselves and our own condition. Mm -hmm. 
So when he started doing that and launching that campaign, it was followed by <laughs> now let's own our own network and control the images that come across the airwaves that give shape to who we are. Mm. When he pitched that proposal, you know the rest that happened. Very few people know that part of the story. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So again, you, you, you got to be careful as to uh, you know, who you're listening to and are you actually hearing the whole story? <laughs> um, and uh, I, I, I was perplexed by the whole thing. Uh, uh, but I, I, in essence, I knew that uh, uh, he was going to be found guilty regardless. Right, mm -hmm. regardless, because of what he was trying to do. Mm -hmm. um, now, uh, uh, now we had another gentleman accused of the same thing and was elected president and served a term. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the same mm -hmm. circumstances. <laughs> and it came out of the woodwork, <laughs> accusations, and he was voted in as President of the United States. Mm. Mm. <laughs> Absolutely. So again, you know what I'm saying? I mean, when you sit back and think about what has transpired, it's like, wow, mm. really? Mm. You know, so again, really, especially think about, especially when they tell you about uh, people who are on campaigns like that. They are always under assault, especially when um, the charge is that or when they are taking on something like that. So I know someone mentioned uh, Dr. Cosby at the, uh, I think it was Paul. So could someone read that for me, please? For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against the principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness, wickedness in high places. Ephesians 6, 12. Now, I, I, I refer to uh, biblical verses here, or this verse here, and I think I've referred to uh, them uh, in other parts of this presentation because it is so intricately tied to Western philosophy. Um, it's a part of the framework that's woven into um, uh, what we are actually consuming. Now, I also have a picture of uh, at the top of this, does anyone recognize this picture? This is a program that had been on. I don't, I don't know if it's still running or not. I think it's canceled now. I don't think it's, it's no longer running. Does anyone know about this particular program? Is it the show called Lucifer? Oh. Yeah. Bingo. Bingo. Now, in this particular program, how, how is Lucifer framed? He's framed as a uh, good guy. He's framed as a good guy. What have we been taught about Lucifer? He's bad. <laughs> <laughs> In this particular program, right? He's a good guy. <laughs> yeah, I'm, that messed me up too because uh, I was talking to a friend about this show and he was talking to me about it and he had 
I told him like, nah, I don't really want to like get into that show. It's like the show is literally called Lucifer, and then he was like, nah, but you gotta watch it. He's actually like the good guy. You just gotta understand like most of the things that that are painted as him as the bad guy, they portray it as him in light. So I was like, yeah, I still don't know about it. <laughs> I don't know. I really want to see that. <laughs> wow. And, and, and see, that's why I thought that this particular uh, passage was fitting because of how we are being programmed to think about this. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? How we're being programmed to think about this. And this program ran for a long time. Right, uh, I think it's just now got canceled, or I don't know how long it's been canceled or going off, but it had a pretty good run. And just like Aaron, your friend was like, "No, you really got to look at it and wrap your head around it because you know what I'm saying. Lucifer was a good guy; he loved us." <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, you think about that though, for real. You had this conversation with your friend and he's an advocate for Lucifer. So, and that's why I just thought that this particular Ephesians 6, 12 was so fitting, <laughs> you know, <laughs> wow. Now, I think Paul alluded to this earlier as well. Um, Instructor. Go ahead. Um, in while we're talking about Lucifer, did you hear about the the this little rapper that came out with a, a Satan shoe? Little you know, Nas. Yeah, <laughs> Wait, so what? I, yeah, it's that it's that rapper that instructor our cool was bumping in the dojo Saturday morning before we yeah, clean. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> Not hardly. But, uh, <laughs> but so I got I got I got my fact actually what what my my father brought it to me talking about Nas had come out with a shoe dedicated to to Satan and I I just knew that didn't make sense so I jumped online bottom line this is the same little little brother that had that hit with the uh Old Town Country Road yeah. or something like that. Right. He, he's, mm -hmm. a, he's a homosexual, which in and of itself is his choice. But the issue I have is that uh, he has a video, man, that is so warped and disturbing. Talk about the images. Uh, I looked at it while I was watching a, a, a gentleman doing a commentary on it, and he cut the, he cut the, the video off. It's so horrible, man, to whereas not only is this uh, individual that's born as a, a, a male dressed as a female, you know, in drag, but literally had the audacity to give the devil a lap dance, man. And and just the, oh, yeah. the, the positioning and the camera angles where they show him sitting on the devil's throne on his lap and then they show him with his back turned to him and his behind tooted up in the air, man, it's just horrible, bro. Oh, and it man. just, it just was devastating, man, to, to see it and to see that and hear that it's like 50 million views within the first couple of days of this coming out. And the whole thing is he had a gym shoe inspired mm -hmm. by an old Nike gym shoe where the marketing was that it was a drop of human blood in the soul, and they got the Pentagon, the, the, the pentagram uh, uh, medallion on it. I mean, just just outlandish, man. And mm -hmm. Just just the 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 the, the, the blatant uh, promotion of such things, you know. Even in the for, from the for the LGBTQ community, I would be outraged if I was of that community because it's giving a horrible representation of people's choice. So I just, I just, I, I don't even advise that y'all go look at it because I literally had images in my mind that I did not like. And it just, it was disturbing. And to be conscious and aware and on purpose, I just can't even imagine what kind of influence it's having on these young people that don't even have a clue. 
Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And it goes back to this particular verse, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against the principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. You, you make the point. Wow, I, I was unaware of that. Mm. Good share. Instructor, um, if I may, like, yeah. I, I would have, like, I would be talking to my pops and my sister, um, about like just outside of TV programming, like I always, once I really started learning like just about more about our people when I'm in school learning like this, seeing the history that they given us, but my parents is really giving me like our history. So I'm learning and I'm looking as a kid, like y'all giving me garbage. Like I can't really trust the information that y'all giving me, but the older that I've gotten, I've started really thinking like, clearly with the, you know tv programming and so on and so forth but like everything in which we choose to look up even like not google none of this stuff is ours bro like we we are basing a lot of our information based off of things in which they provide for us and you know it's like you breaking free by still eating out of the big house like it don't make sense you know what i'm saying like it, it don't work that way you we got to really have everything of our own, but the programming runs so deep. I wonder if our people will um, come to a point in which, you know, we don't have to do, we don't have to continue to use their tools and resources to have our own, but they did a hell of a job, you know, destroying our own like knowledge, you know what I'm saying? Our own ways and so on and so forth. So to rebuild from scratch is, kind of where we at for real like and where to go because of a lost history i don't know but this program it really does run deep and like the spiritual it really starts with kids like the spiritual um programming from higher powers like why are they teaching us these things my pops um would like give me you know stories tell me things like with the jews like what hitler would do with orchestras and have certain um like tunes and like songs playing that were aggressive and would make the Jews coming to the camps feel a certain way, but he was messing with their frequencies based on the frequency that the orchestra was playing at. Mm -hmm. Things like that. Like it's always been programming, but I don't know. Like I just want to know <laughs> what do we do next? Like how do we got what is the break free? Well, yeah, the, and, and, and part, of, uh, part of the presentation is uh, to offer a break free. Um, uh, and that's why at the top of this, making the case for involutionary change, that you have to actively be involved in the process. Because if you're not actively involved in the process, or if you are unaware, you will and are being programmed, <laughs> whether mm. you are aware of it or not. Mm. And, uh, and then, so the next case here is made for uh, about um, the music. Uh, instructor Aku uh, shared uh, about uh, the music video and promoting a shoe, a Satan shoe. I, I, I was unaware of that. Um, however, the, the, um, the, uh, uh, music industry is very, very powerful industry as well. Um, and what makes the music industry, uh, so powerful and music powerful is because, and I think Aisha, if I can, if I remember you saying this and you correct me if I'm wrong, uh, you mentioned this earlier uh, in the presentation where music goes past the filter. You can listen to a music song and it'll, depending on what's being played, 
it actually goes right past the filters that are designed to block um, uh, certain information out. I believe you shared that, Aisha. Was it you? It was Mama Aisha for sure. She dropped a bomb last week. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Can some, someone read this particular one uh, for me, please? Most of the programming set the tone for what the youth thinks, what to wear, what is in, what not to wear, what's out, introduces new languages, terms, what is socially acceptable and what is not, what the drug of choice should be. Okay, good, good. Kimmy, could you keep going for me? Yes, the principle of vibration Nothing rests, everything moves, everything vibrates. You want me to read the chart as well or just under the chart? Under the chart first. Okay, this hermetic principle was offered by our ancestors thousands of years ago. It explains that the difference between different manifestations of matter, energy, mind, and even spirit results from varying rates of vibration. Okay, so this chart and I want you to read the chart too, Kimmy. Uh, this chart, uh, when asked the question, you know, as I was formulating this, does uh, music actually affect the chakras? And it does. Uh, so could you, could you read those uh, for me, Kimmy? Yes. Uh, fork names, UT, <laughs> frequency, in Hertz, 369, chakra root, characteristics, liberate from guilt and fear. Fork names, re, uh, 417, sacral, undoing situations and facilitate change. Me, 528, navel, transformations and miracles, DNA repair. Five, 692, I mean 639, sorry heart connecting relationships, soul, 741, throat expression, lie, 852, brow, awakening intuition, and then nothing, uh, 963, crown, connect with light and spirit. Right. So these are frequencies and the fork names is, I'm, I'm gathering that these are tuning forks, um, some of this stands out like do re mi fa so la ti do you know those tunes are those okay come through vocals come through brothers go say small town okay <laughs> but they do these frequencies do impact or have an effect on the chakras uh, and as offered here our ancestors offered that thousands of years ago um, and uh, uh, sharing with us how um, Can I um, chime in if that's okay before we move on? Go ahead, go ahead. Um, so um, I'm also in school right now and I'm taking a, lingu uh, a literature class and our class is on music, but we write papers. So um, my first paper that I wrote recently was a argumentative paper about music and how it affects the brain and the brain waves. Um, based on instructor wow. Keith's lesson. Wow. And so I was doing um, my own research to back up my argument. And um, basically I tied it into how music actually heals the body better than medicine. And one thing I found was how much, um, I don't want to slaughter this word, but by neural, 
I think by oh, Neural Beats. Yep. Mm. Yes. So um that came from well, that's like the source of healing as well as connecting to the vibrations and the chakras, which is why a lot of meditative music use those specific beats in order to change the frequencies of the brain waves at the same time, which is also used in um, music therapy that they use like outside of hospital settings, but is used to heal not only like anxiety and depression, but also like literally health issues that can be healed through music by changing the frequencies of the brain. So um, I tapped into a lot of that when I wrote my paper and it was just very interesting because I'm like, wow, you know, we've been learning about brain waves and then we, you know, we use meditation music, but do we really know what we're actually listening to? Mm -hmm. Like we, we tune in like, oh yeah, this is so soothing or, you know, and sometimes what we pick might not even be the type of music that we need to listen to in order to, you know, raise our vibration and such. So they use specific beats and then that came from, you know, Africa. And like you said, like, um, and where you use the singing bowls and the the forks and everything, those came from that. And then that's what actually started music. And that's, and I also touched on how OM um, was the beginning sound and mm -hmm. that started, you know, everything else that came along and that's where music comes from. And it's just crazy how much it has transitioned over time to where it can be such a negative thing when really it's supposed to be used for such a positive and healing, um, it comes from a positive and healing place. So um, that was interesting to me. Right, right. Yeah, that is, that, is, that was. Very Can I add something to that? Is it possible? Yes, please. And, and Kimmy, I like what you said when you said healing, because when we talk about hip hop, people, people don't understand it's an acronym for high infinite power healing our people. That's what hip hop is supposed to be. But we, we don't, it, clearly that ain't what's happening. But when we're talking about the frequencies and everything like that, the initial purpose for hip hop was to uplift us. And now that it has been infiltrated, we are where we are today. So we have to reclaim that, you know. And that was pretty much, that was, that was it. Yeah, yeah, because initially it started off, um, uh, that way, Jeremiah, to where it was uh, liberating. And then um, the influx of, um, uh, you know, the hate music uh, uh, or, um, uh, you know, belittling uh, our women and the like started being kind of added into that. And it was the opposite of what it was actually intended to be. So yes, very powerful shares. Thank you. Can somebody get this slide for me, please? Can this affect my chakras? Music and frequencies can have a tremendous impact on your chakra. This programming has been used in war and brainwashing conditioning programming. And a few examples at the bottom, music has been used for thousands of years in war. The Battle of Jericho, Joshua and the Trumpet in biblical times, Aztecs used the death whistle and it sounded like the screams of dying men. Spartans marched to the sound of flutes. Drums used by General George Washington and General Andrew Jackson. And then Africans and Native Americans used war drums. Mm -hmm. And the same thing with this chart at, uh, offering um, the notes and the frequencies and the sounds, uh, the vowel sounds, if, uh, especially in the wording as well uh, offered here. So here offering how uh, music uh, and how they use music uh, to, as a method of interrogation without leaving marks. Uh, uh, Emerson, could you read that for me, please? 
<clears throat> yeah, I got you. Uh, this is a way to interrogate without leaving marks. Central intelligence and major media circuits have played a huge role in the promotion of using music to brainwash prisoners of war and civilians. Wow. However, Pavlovian psychology is the father of these types of assaults on the human psyche. Now, if you can remember at the top, I was uh, offering uh, the major players uh, in uh, psychology. And uh, Pavlov was one of the major players uh, where um, uh, he did this experiment with the dog. And when he hit the bell, the dog starts salivating. Remember that? It's the basic psychology class that we all, we, we've all taken. Yes, you sir. Know? Yeah. So he is like the father of these. So when he did that experiment, they took that experiment and like ran with it and used the music. If they say that, well, if you can use the tuning fork or you can use a sound to cause a dog to salivate, we can use sound to actually control um, human beings or, 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 or cause similar effects on the human psyche. Uh, so they took his research and been building on the research for years. And they don't really talk a lot about how they used the major uh, pieces of uh, uh, the framework to do what they're doing now. Uh, uh, so they, they've taken it from uh, a bell causing a dog to salivate to uh, uh, a sister gyrating, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So uh, they've taken it on a whole nother level. <laughs> using music for us to turn on each other actually and go to war with each other. So uh, they've actually used it uh, uh, against us and uh, there's some other ways that they've, they've actually used music uh, in uh, psychological uh, warfare. Uh, can someone read this particular slide for me, please? Music will. Oh. Hey, new babe. Sorry. Music will continue to be used in psychological operations in the future. It is a part of the NATO. Uh, psychological operations doctrine. Loudspeaker message gains attention of target audience. Use jingles or local music. Target analysis <clears throat> should be done with care. Exploit types of music favored by target audience should be specific and easily identifiable. The age, the group, the ethnicity, class, etc. Yeah. yeah. So this particular picture is a helicopter with loudspeakers and music that, they, that this helicopter was flown over uh, targeted areas and these, this music was being played, you know, as a part of the, uh, uh, the, the psychological attack uh, formed, formulated in Vietnam. Uh, so music has been a very active part in uh, psychological uh, warfare. Uh, it hasn't gone anywhere. It's still prevalent today. <laughs> it's still being used uh, in this community. Uh, in other communities, it's used against uh, race and class. <laughs> So it, it, it has gone beyond just being used on blacks. 
it has been used on classes of people um, uh, as well. Um, so I just wanted to offer that there. Uh, now this is a, um, I adopted this um, for every school that I've worked with, I've changed their creed. This is one of the creeds that uh, I offer schools um, uh, and, and use for the school that I run. And I have uh, students say this every, every morning. <laughs> uh, uh, I, I don't know if you, you guys know, I'm kind of like, a, um, well, I'm like a Joe Clark, right? And so I am assigned schools that are in trouble. Uh, that's, that's how I started the work. So they would, uh, uh, initially I was a part of a team that visited schools that had uh, serious cultural, cultural problems. And uh, so we would hang out in the school for about a week and then we would meet with the administration and uh, suggest to them things that they should do to turn the culture around. It was uh, the part of the uh, team that I worked with was called School Works. Um, I was, I had done that for some years. Uh, I would go to schools all over the country and uh, just hang out in schools. You know what I'm saying? And uh, meet with the principal, meet with the administrative team and give some suggestions. And then um, after that work, then I became interested in uh, being a principal myself. So uh, then, uh, uh, you know, started uh, working with troubled schools in this particular management company. And this was one of the, um, uh, creeds that uh, I introduced um, to, um, to the team and had the students share every morning, <laughs> um, which is a very uh, awful. And I would use this to interact with them uh, when, uh, not before they got in trouble, but when they got in trouble, <laughs> then I would take them through this particular um, uh, mantra, if you will. Why should you watch your thoughts? They become your words. Why should you watch your words? They become your actions. Why should you watch your actions? They become your habits. Why should you watch your habits? They become your character. Why should you, uh, why should you watch your character? Or it becomes your destiny. I change the wording around and ask the question why for each one of those. Uh, very powerful uh, change in everywhere where this has been used. Uh, but it has to be actively used and not just empty words that you say. So when you understand the mind is what you think you become, you become an active part of your own self-development. You see unlearning is a very important process towards becoming enlightened because in this life, you will have long, learned wrong ways. And those wrong ways that you have learned are barriers blocking you from becoming who you really are. Therefore, it is vital that they are unlearned. Your thoughts, you create your thoughts, your thoughts, create your imaginations and your intentions create your reality. I think this is the last slide. What's my time look like, Keith? 25 minutes. 25 minutes. 
Okay, cool, cool. So um, I believe that this is the last slide. So I want to I want you to just go through Yep, this is the last slide. So go through reading these slides and I want you to answer the questions in your notes. So the first question is, professionally, how do you see yourself? Okay. Um, how do dynamic people speak to themselves? Okay. How do you change your frequency? Can you upgrade your self image? How does self talk sound with creative people? Intentional work in the abstract of your mind, what would that look like? So this part of the presentation is homework. And just taking those questions, answering them in your notes, and then sharing them when we start part five which is the last part. Any questions about what the expectations are? No, sir. No, sir. Okay. So I'm gonna leave this slide up so you can write the questions down or you guys can take a picture of this slide and just reflect on what you've been given and uh, now too, how do you see yourself? Uh, how do you see yourself professionally? Uh, how do you see, you, you know, uh, and for those of you who are still in school, some of you are working and in school. Some of you are just school, which is fine. So how do you see yourself as a student? Um, or how do you see yourself in both worlds uh, as a student and as a professional person? Um, how do dynamic people speak to themselves? What would, what does that language sound like, look like? Uh, frequency change. How do you change your frequency? Can you upgrade your self image? How does self-talk sound with creative people? intentional work in the abstract of your mind, what would that look like? What was the last question instructor, please repeat it. Okay. Intentional work in the abstract of your mind. What would that intentional work look like? Mm, thank you. Mm -hmm. Hey, P, can you send me the questions? I'm driving right now. <laughs> I got you, fam. I screenshot them. I got you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So that concludes uh, this presentation. Uh, I wanted to stay on time. It was my intention to get through four and leave the last part as a standalone. So uh, I wanted to get to this homework slide. So this is the only homework that you did have out of all of the presentations. So I wanted you to kind of like culminate what you're getting from all of these uh, presentations and uh, you're responsible for sharing out. I want everyone to share. This is not a sit and get. 
So um, in that, you know, homework is given, I'm going to ask all of you to share out in the homework. So please take a screenshot of these questions or write them down, share them out. And the next time that we meet that we're going to open up and you guys are going to share good news as always. And then we're going to share in, uh, you know, what you're gleaning from the homework. All right, instructors, do you have anything to add or commentary or the like? Masterful class, uh, instructor. Thank you for um, thank you, sir, for leading leading the charge as usual, and um, yeah, man. Just most impressive, uh, masterfully done, and impossible. Okay, I appreciate that. Yeah, I was gonna say, you know, just echo those same uh, sentiments. Um, definitely very, very powerful class. And um, <clears throat> really, I just look at these presentations as, the tools to take, you know, our mind and ultimately our power back. Um, and I, I really like that question about, you know, do you control your own thoughts? And um, just, you know, kind of exploring that because a lot of people don't think about where their thoughts are constructed uh, yes. or the, the content of the thought pretty much and so you know once you go down that path you kind of see like you know as you you know some of the uh, quotes you put up but the those who obviously control the um, media that you receive those that control the language those that control um, the images that you see you know, of self for others, now you get to see like, wow, the thoughts that I think are not even my own. Mm -hmm. And most of those thoughts have been intentionally supplanted by those who don't have my best interest in, in mind and heart. And so, you know, just drawing awareness to that now gives us the opportunity to take control of what we consume consciously and subconsciously and ultimately mm -hmm. take back control of our you know thoughts and our mind and that yeah. so yeah definitely appreciate you know this very thought-provoking um class and as always look forward to the next one <laughs> yeah sorry. thank you brother that's just where i was going with that this um thank you for that i'm glad uh, i was able to open that door Thank you. Mm -hmm. I think uh, Kimmy had her hand up too. Kimmy, I'm sorry, I, I can't see, so you guys have to help me with that. I don't think I raised my hand, but <laughs> I did. <laughs> <laughs> I did think about when you brought up the music and how it was programmed. It's uh, been programmed for a long time, and how they were using it in war mm -hmm. um, against people it made me think of i don't know if, uh, uh have uh, people watched robot chicken before but the intro to robot chicken they put like a chicken in front of a whole bunch of tv screens and they they use this device to keep his eyeballs open and they're making him like watch all this different programming that trains his brain but it's like a bunch of garbage and it's like um i don't know if it's real but i've seen that a lot of times on tv where they use like they put people in places where they make them watch certain things or listen to th certain things as a torturing mechanism mm -hmm. and i don't know if that's real or not but i'm like i kind of feel well obviously it is from what you brought up oh yeah it's because, real. Uh, um, they don't even have to make you do it no more sometimes we voluntarily do it 
Right. Yeah. And, it's, and that's a crazy thing. And it's like, you know, um, it's a topic of debate all the time, too, especially with music. Uh, and I would say a lot of times with female artists, female rap artists, they talk about, you know, the certain things that they portray and it's like, oh, well, you know, our kids shouldn't be watching this. And then a lot of times they say, well, it's not my job to raise your kids. It's your job to raise your kids. But at the same time, you know, the content that you put out is out there for everyone to see. So it's, it's almost like how much can we control our kids from watching or how much can we control our kids listening to you know because it's all around us it's 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 what's put out on the mainstream that's why I don't listen to the radio but it's it's just almost like we have to be um intentional about everything that we do not just certain things but literally everything that we do and when we're talking about putting things in our body we're not just talking about through the mouth either we're talking about through the ears we're talking about through the eyes through the nose through the mouth literally everywhere and that's the only way we're able to be truly intentional about what we want to get out of life and to be our best selves so that's what i got on this thank you instructor oh thank you yeah you you, you got it <laughs> absolutely thank you Uh, <clears throat> um, should instruct it before I go. Before I go. Um, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, today's topic made me think about um, this book I read called Soul Babies uh, by Mark Anthony Neal. Mm -hmm. uh, and his other book called Soul Thieves. So, basically, in both of the books, it talked about the, um, the misrepresentation of uh, African culture. And basically how society try to use our, our image um, in a negative way to promote negative behavior um, amongst our people. And so far um, it's been working as you can see in today's, in today's time period. And um, basically in the book, it was talking about like back in the day, um, it, it mentioned Curtis Mayf um, Mayfield, um, uh, I forgot the uh, song, the, the album. It's uh, was Superfly, Superfly. Superfly, yeah. Yeah, so in, in the, um, it talks about Superfly, how that album, um, you know, it's basically about the, you know, the pimps and et cetera, but Curtis Mayfield used it to bring out the pain to basically uh, to deliver a message amongst us so we can know what and not to do. Um, but like I said, the book is a great book. Uh, Mark Anthony had some some great some great points throughout the book, and um, like I was saying again, he was just telling us like how the media try to use us in a negative way. So we got to be careful, and we can't allow on you know this um, the white supremacy because that's what they was talking about to keep manipulating us and to going down the wrong road. Yeah, absolutely. I'm gonna get that book. Uh, is uh, it's another book that uh, is in that realm, um, called Brainwash. I don't know if anybody's ever read it. Um, Ter Terrell, I believe the the author's last name is Terrell, but it it it, it goes through the uh brainwash you do in the condition is to break condition people as well so that's another good book to uh, I'm, 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 I'm gonna post it up so you know people can probably check it out and i'm definitely gonna check out that soul baby that even sound good soul baby but uh yeah that's another book to check out yeah absolutely thank you for sharing let me jump in real quick uh instructor uh, great class man great class um Thank you. Got me fired up, man. Got me fired up. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> yes, sir. You know, got, 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 got fired up. Got, got me fired up, man. You know, um, I I just appreciate uh, just I'm just looking at you know just uh, the the presentation on 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 several levels. One, I'm 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 looking at you uh, as uh, kind of like uh, like my elder, like my elder brother, you know, 
and um, always, always looking, you know, to uh, not only my my peers and, um, you know, even inspired, you know, by by the younger brothers as well, you know, but but I'm always looking forward uh, because uh, I too will be in one capacity or another um, in the future, you know, where I'm, you know, working with uh, just members of our community and, right. and always looking, you know, I'm always looking to see how do how do we uh, stay stay inspired? Like, wh what do we do to stay inspired to keep uh, the mission and the vision alive? Like, wh wh what do we do? Yes. And uh, and so I, I see you, <laughs> That's right. and I see how you charged up, you know, and uh, you know, and it's just uh, it's just inspiring uh, to uh, to not only take this uh, information and and we deal with it you know, on a, on a psychological level. But of course, this also uh, has an impact just on our, on, our, on our overall being, which will express itself uh, on the floor as well. So yeah. it's just multi, a multifaceted, applicable um, uh, uh, information, but, but I, I guess I should say uh, the application of it is multi, multifaceted. Is. And, uh, you know, and, and, and the thing is, we, we, we really do, we have to continue to stay vibrant, um, you know, as we go forth into our higher selves, into our higher collective selves, um, you know, and so I just, uh, I'm just appreciative. Uh, I just, I, you know, I'm looking at the, the information, you, you know, we're looking at it from a sociological, historical, psychological perspective, but then ultimately it's internally, like that's the big thing. How do we make this, um, and I appreciate the challenges and the questions to get us to reflect, you know, on this information to cause internal transformation for the uh, outward application in all of our ways of being. So, you know, not just, of course, uh, martially, but of course, in our way of being family and our way of being community. Uh, how do we impact and motivate one another? Um, you know, so just very rich and inspiring. And so I'll just cut it there. I could go on and on, <laughs> but uh, thank you again. And uh, yeah, looking forward to continue uh, to continue to work. Yes, sir. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Uh, you you kind of like give rise to what you say. You know what motivates uh, us to keep the charge going, and I would think about uh, Master Jawad and what he wanted our charge to collectively be. He wanted us to be black belts of life. And uh, this is a part of the charge, not just being able to kick ass on the floor uh, when somebody put their hands on you, but you need to be able to kick ass in the boardroom or any room that you find yourself representative of your people and yourself. Uh, uh, you, uh, I, I see myself as part of that charge as an instructor to give you the proper tools to deal. I um, realize that 90% of our work as martial arts instructors, 90% of our work is with the mind only 10% actually happens out on the floor. So I take the 90% with the mind very seriously. As you can see here, uh, 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 just giving presentations and waking our people up like this, um, uh, as I think is a very pivotal part of what we're supposed to be doing so that it all culminates together. And just as you said, uh, Kenyatta, it's a multifaceted approach to uh, martial arts instruction. Uh, and as uh, instructor Ku said, it's, it's definitely a New Testament. Yes, sir. <laughs> Indeed. Um... I just wanted to say this last uh, few pieces real quick. Uh, I remember instructor said, sharing with me uh, 
you know, when he came into the discipline, uh, he, he actually came through um, uh, GMK's uh, African history class. Yes. And, yeah. and, uh, and so just sort of fast forwarding, uh, looking at what you all as instructors, uh, you know, you, North, you know, instructor said, you know, instructor Aku, I mean, you all are, are taking, I mean, he started <laughs> with the yeah. African history and yeah. now you all are taking the discipline and, and, uh, and just really just, uh, just going forward into our being and, and yeah. just everything, man. And it's just really a beautiful thing. Yeah. And, um, you know, I, I'd say this too. I just remember, uh, you know, you talk about those images. I remember in Anthony Broder's book, um, I don't know if you all have heard of it, probably most of you all have heard of Now Valley uh, Contributions to Civilizations. And uh, he, he put up an image of Superman with Arnold, you know, from different strokes uh, looking in, it was almost as if he was looking in the mirror, but he, instead of seeing himself, you know, he saw um, Superman like Clark Kent, um, Christopher Reeves, uh, mm -hmm. you know, as the image. And uh, it just kind of goes to show you how um, it's so important for all of our brethren and sister in, in, our, in our circle here uh, who are active in, in image creation, um, you know, Brother Hero, and we got a couple of other uh, image, image artists uh, amongst our circle. It's such sacred work. I mean, it goes all the way back to the images, you know, on our temples. And it's just, you know, all of it was to inspire something internally, even though we see it externally on the walls, uh, you know, from the temples to graffiti. Uh, but ultimately, it was all a reflection of, of something that we were striving for um, internally. Um, so yeah, so just I just see the the, the cross <laughs> curricular <laughs> application of it all, man. So give thanks, man. You know, I said, bro. Okay. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Any other instructors? Ghosts? Instructor said. Instructor Nate. Brother, I'll, I'll jump on. Um, <sighs> brother, my mind went a million different places <laughs> on this one. Um, yeah, a powerful presentation. The, uh, the implications are fast. Um, where I want to go now, though, is, I guess, a reminder to not, not, restrict this information to race, to black and white. It goes even beyond that. Mm -hmm. That is absolutely there. Uh, but I think it's more of a misdirection uh, than the ultimate goal. Um, it, it is vast because all races are, are subjected to this same information through the same uh, uh, mind control, I'm gonna say this, this sorcery, I like to call it. Mm -hmm. um, so a, a reminder of that. And boy, uh, yeah, yeah, I, I can go a million different places. I, I'm not, but it's been said over and over on the call. But uh, again, really enjoyed the presentation. And I'm definitely looking forward to the next one. Yes, sir. Thank you, brother. Appreciate that. Instructor said, I just want to compliment that word that we won't go, we will not jump down the rabbit hole tonight, but sorcery is such a powerful, powerful word, brother, because the, the, the enemy absolutely operates in the spirit realm first. They, they recognize the power of spirit first as yes. over the planet and, and sorcery speaks directly to that activity. Yes. That, that was a great word, brother. Yes. Well, uh, if there are no other thoughts, commentary, uh, that concludes this part of the presentation. I wanted to end it up with that homework. Um, 
And uh, the last presentation is going to be, uh, parts of the last presentation is gonna be next week. We're gonna start with good news as we always have. And uh, also going to uh, the expectations regarding the kind of work uh, sharing out on um, the questions that were offered to you uh, as homework. So looking forward to seeing some of you. I'll see some of you tomorrow. Uh, those that I don't see tomorrow, I'll see Saturday. And I will be looking forward to uh, talking to you and seeing you soon. Peace, peace. Love, family. Peace, y'all. Peace. peace. Thank you, instructor. All right. Peace, peace, peace family. Peace. 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 Love you guys. Peace. 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 peace, family. Most.